we're going to do fill my cup okay, lord in our okay, hebrews and then we didn't have to have this pickup we're going to do fill my cup lord mm -hmm. in our hymnal that is hymn number Thank you very much, Darius. Uh, Amen. Welcome, Pastor, to take us through the sermon. Amen. Uh, thank you. I want to thank all of you, uh, uh, Brother Gideon, and uh, all us in attendance. I see a good number here. I'm encouraged. 
And I want to thank you too for the music that has come in, the instruments that have been presented. So beautiful. Well, I feel so humbled to be welcomed by Pastor Macharia. Um, I know Pastor Macharia are the old men of faith that uh, may not know many things and how they inspired some of us when we were coming up. Pastor Macharia was my executive director when I was still a lady in Nakuru. I remember his pigeon 504 uh, that he used to drive all the way to Nakuru to come and minister to us when I was still an elder in Nakuru. And therefore, you know, it's, it's humbling again when the world brings you around and uh, you find yourself introduced by a man of God who I know now is in his sunset days. <laughs> yes, I've found a new vocabulary, a sober old man. <laughs> I hope that is true because in old age, the tendency is always to be anxious. <laughs> but uh, if you find a sober old man, I guess that is by the grace of God that uh, God has given you. And much more. Uh, person I remember uh, as, a, as a young adult around 20, 2021, 20, that is the time I want to say the language I knew that those days were, that's when I was born again, you know, I started with being born again, I was not an Adventist, so I knew the language of being born again. <laughs> and I know that one of the things, the testimony I found when I got born again, as a young person, was that in the midst of all the anxiety of a young person, I don't know, many of you who are young, you can resonate with that, that at a certain age, especially when you're young, there is this anxiety, you know, about the dreams of life. And uh, that time I'd finished my high school and I was wondering what am I going to become? What am I going to do? I was from a humble background. I was staying with my grandparents. So everything looked very blank. The, the, the sure thing that I, I had at that time was to wake up and go and look after my grandfather's cows. And I was wondering that I'd finished high school and all that was sure. And you know, my grandfather, for him, he had done a great accomplishment because he had taken me to school. I was in sort of a, a national school. I'd done my high school. So for him, nothing was bothering. He could sit back in his small canteen and tell the passerby that his son has finished high school. But as a young man, um, I was so anxious. I was wondering what next, you know, my grandfather could not now sponsor me for my college. So we were just hoping that probably the TSC, TS, TSC would take me to become a teacher. So, but that is the time I went to Nakuru and uh, I got born again as a Catholic. You know, that time as Catholics, we were being born again. They have, in Catholicism, they have something they call charismatic. Charismatic are the born again Catholics. So I was born again as a Catholic and uh, my journey began there of seeking God. And I want to tell you that when we went for a meeting as old people uh, with other old people came with the testimony that, you know, since I was born again, my children are now behaving. Some were saying since I was born again, I wanted to buy a land. I now bought it. But as a young person, the only thing that was sure testimony that I'm born again and my life had changed was peace. You know, the wild life that was open to me as a young man was no longer something that I was craving for. I was so much at peace. My wondering and thinking that, well, I'll come back to them. <clears throat> but you know, I remained until today, until the Lord has granted me now to preach his word. So I want to say that peace, that the word may be very funny, sober but it's true that when you come to know the lord jesus as a young person you can attest of his peace that can keep your heart you you, you know at that time maybe another small testimony before i get into my sermon was um i as i worked i started working in a textile industry in Nakuru called bedi and as i was working there um I, you know the lord had impressed upon me to be praying at a certain time in the night that was three o'clock and uh, now we were working from six in the evening to eight in the morning you were locked up in a textile industry 
Those are the days, if you remember, those who are alive, many of you may not have been born, but those who are alive, those are the days when people could go into a factory and tomorrow we hear news that people are consumed by fire in the factory because Indians used to, to lock people in that factory the whole night. So if there's fire, you know you are gone. Um, I got stopped my job. I lost my job at that time uh, because I had to go and pray and my supervisor felt that that was just a jive. I wanted to go and sleep. So I left work. Uh, but at the time I was staying alone, I had a house to pay and I already also began my journey of study. I'd enrolled myself with Kasnib, private student as an accountant. Um, and I remember that I knew I needed to pay a house and I needed to pay for my next Kasnib exams. So the job, I was stopped and I was in dilemma. And that's the time when my landlord came around and told me, uh, was talking about installing a, 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 par a paraffin at, his, uh, at, the, at the residence where we were staying. And I remember as a young man, I think I was 23, 24, I told the landlord that I'm ready to be the watchman. And uh, he didn't believe it. He said, no, I'm joking. But I said, I'm ready because I needed money to pay for the rent and also to pay for the house. <laughs> so he tested me. So I started working for two weeks. He came back, he asked the caretaker, is this is the young man doing his work? The caretaker said, yes, he's doing his work. So they started negotiating the price, the, my wage. I told them I need, eight, I think it was 500 shillings per month. No, it was 700 shillings per month. Then they told me even watchmen that are under company are only paid 500. How can they pay me 700? And then I told them, you know, those who are under the company, they have insurance. Me, I don't have insurance. I need all my money, eat and die with it. So, <laughs> but the thing I want to tell you that at that time as a young man, I was at ease to take up a, a watchman job because I knew what I wanted. I needed money to pay for my college. So I didn't have this air on my, sh uh, you know, you know what I mean? That I couldn't be a watchman. I needed that, I needed it only to be my stepping stone to my destination. And this is my encouragement. To, uh, this is part of what Jesus does in our hearts. He takes away, you know, when Jesus gets to wash his disciples' feet, he knew that he had the love of God in him. He didn't care about that manual labor. We as young people, that is a place we can beat the world, that we can take up anything, we can occupy anything, as long as it's something that can push us to our destiny. Uh, I say that because I wanted just to acknowledge how God is good and how he can do great things in people's life. Many people who look at me now that I am a doctor, it's, it's some people, in fact, my father is not an Adventist, he's still a Catholic. And currently he calls me on Friday and tell me happy, happy Sabbath uh, because he tells, he's telling people that the only God I know is the God of my son. You see, uh, he's still a Catholic, but he has seen how God has done things in my life. From, I, I did start off as a good boy, but he saw my transformation and he saw me coming up and where I am. And that is what I'm talking about. So my message this evening is also still to that effect that we wake up. So let's, uh, let me prepare my sharing and then we can pray and open our Bibles, the book of Romans, the book of Romans chapter 13, the book of Romans chapter 13, I want you to read verse 11 through 14, the book of Romans chapter 13, and I want to read uh, through. Uh, let us pray as we read that word, as I open the word, Romans 13, uh, Romans 13, verse 11 to 14. Let us pray. Indeed, Lord, our Father, we who know you, we are highly privileged, and we cannot stop to praise you, to glorify your holy name, because of the great things you have done, even when you have not done them, as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego attested at in the time in the past. Father, we have still had the staying power, the power that and granted us to endure and persevere, and seen how you granted us to grow in things that were intended to destroy us, but you have made them to be our testimony. Yes, Lord, the 
things that mess become the message that we now preach. Today, Lord, again, I pray that you will bless me as I share with this generation, which we believe that many of them that will be diligent to these things will indeed be able to stand and be the rebuke of the evil generation. Father, bless us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So the Romans 13 verse 11, the Bible says, besides this, you know the time, the hour has come for you to wake up or to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone. The day is at hand. So then, let us cast off the works of darkness and form the armor of light. Let us walk properly in the daytime, not in ogres and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality or sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for flesh to gratify its desires. And you can see that in the first verse 11, Romans 13, 11, we find the word, the first command, and that is our main. 13, 11 says, our, it's the time to wake up. That is a text that we are looking at today. Now, the point that seems to be big in this text is living in the light of eternity changes your priorities. That seems to be the big thing that Paul is trying to suggest to us, that the time and the hour has come for you to wake up for, that for your salvation is nearer. That is the hope. The salvation here is not that which is present, that is speaking about that which they are experiencing, it's not even the past salvation, which has to do with what Jesus has done for us, but it's the salvation that is yet to be revealed in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So living in the light of that hope of salvation, living in that light, the relation of the Son of God, whom we know very much that now is so sure of his coming, given of the things we are witnessing around us, that ought to change our priorities. And that's why we are saying here that how much of what you did like yesterday, how much of what you did was motivated by your conscious awareness of the coming of the Lord? That's the big question we want to ask. The things you did yesterday, all the things you have been doing, how much of them would uh, have been motivated by your awareness that the Lord Jesus or your salvation is drawing nigh. In another way, we could ask that question, what of if today was your last day? How would you live out your life? How would you live out your life? That is another question is, if you are like me, you will all have to admit that not much of what my actions, my activities are usually motivated with that awareness. In fact, it's when I was preparing this message that I also began to ask myself, the things I do every day, how much of them are motivated by the awareness that this could just be my last day? You know, children of God, with COVID-19, if you have not become so aware of how sure you can die anytime, then I guess you're still living in a different world. COVID-19 or coronavirus has truly made every man to be so aware. You know, people had began to live like death is, uh, you know, a, a negative thinking. But now we have to live in the light of that we can die anytime. And, but we want to put it in a better manner to say that living in the light of eternity, living in that light that our salvation draweth nigh than the time we first believe. So we, as I am confessing now that I get so caught up daily in pressures and deadlines, especially as a teacher, you have to read papers, you're moving from one class to another, and you're so busy the whole day uh, that it's, it's impossible sometimes to live a life in the big picture of eternity of what is about to come. You know, I do forget that Jesus is coming and I should be living each day in the light of that great event, meaning my life. Sister White makes it even more explicit. She says that you ought to, to live each day as though it is your last day 
but plan your days as though you still have a thousand days to live. That is a big picture that we are seeking. And therefore, when we're looking at this call to wake up, this wake up call is given to us in, in, in respect or in association of what is yet coming, their salvation, our salvation. The Bible tells us when we see these things that are surrounding us now, lift up your eyes for your salvation is drawing nigh. So those are the big questions. How are we motivated? How are you, what motivates your priorities? We are all career people, most of us are career. We We need to become these tough questions. We're in school. Our prospects are not very sure. You know, the days we left school, if you are privileged, like many of you, to be in university, it was a given thing that you come out and you have a job. But those are not the sure things in your times. And you find that life is becoming more and more disillusioning, you know, disappointing, you know, lacking purpose. How can you transform that? to give you positive energy and you may know what do I need to do? So these are the questions of which we need to ask. As we approach Romans 13, we understand it in the context of Romans 12. Now, we don't have time to go into the larger context of Romans, but you know, the book of Romans, we all know was the book that uh, instigated transform, uh, reformation. This is a book that Martin Luther read and once he read it and read that text in Romans chapter one that says the just shall live by faith, it started the reformation, it started the revival, or if you so wish, started the primitive godliness that we are testing all. Because he understood the fact, number one, of God's faithfulness. He understood of what God is able to do for him. And as a Catholic, he appreciated the fact that he didn't have to go upstairs in indulgence but he understood that this is the way of God. The just shall live by faith. In fact, on his commentary, a Roman, on the book of Romans, Luther will write and say, reading the book of Romans is like standing on, on the gate of heaven. It's like when you're reading the book of Romans, you're studying in the book of heaven. And that is very true because when you look at the larger context of the book of Romans, it gives you a picture of what God is able to do for our life. When you look chapter one, and chapter two, you see that no man is able to stand before God. Whether you are born in the church, like he speaks to the Jew in chapter two, he says they had the law, but even of them, the things that are they keep also among all that are collected together in Romans three, where the Bible says all have sin and fallen short of the glory of God. So the only path that we stand before God in Romans four, he says like of Abraham, that God justified before even he became truly a man of God, calling out of a pagan one, and then in him, he declared all his promises. So when you follow chapter four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine, Paul is developing just that fact of how we are accepted in God. He talks about it even in contrast of how we have fallen in Romans chapter five, speaking of our contrast with Adam in one man, all have been condemned in the same manner, in the same one man. Not a universal salvation, but in contrasting that in one man, also in one man, God is giving salvation. Just like in one man, all are dying. And then in chapter six, you can see the struggle that comes around, which could be possible for anyone. He begins to ask us, does it mean then if we are all accepted in one man's act of righteousness, we don't need to keep anything. We don't need to bother uh, keeping ourselves upright before God. And then that is the problem he tries to explain and tells us something similar that what we are going to listen to here in the analogy of wake up, because he says, if you are dead, you cannot still walk in the ways of the dead. If you are ar arisen in the newness of life in Jesus Christ, you need to walk in that life. But you know, he's so sure he knows there's a Waterloo in chapter seven. He says, you know, why is it that still even then, though it is true that in Christ, God has given me righteousness, it is true that in Christ, I am accepted in God and I have peace with God. What is it in Romans seven? The reality is the thing I think I want to do, but I don't do. I all still find myself struggling. Why? 
And then he comes to the end with a praise and say, wow, people, praise be to God, because now I understand. It's only in Christ that I'm not condemned, not in myself. Now I know that in me, the things that are there are all evil, but in Christ, I am acceptable. And then he turns to his brothers, the Jew in Romans 9 and 10, and in 11, he talks about how they also failed to this graciousness of God. When he begins chapter 12, now he begins to call to people to leave out the objective truth, to leave out the truth that he has been establishing from chapter 1 to, 12, to, 10, to 11. Now he says, now I want you to leave it out. That's why the context of chapter 13 begins in chapter 12, where Paul is telling people, leave your life, leave your present life in the light of the past mercies. The things God has done to you, may they motivate you to leave you the way you live today. You know, God is not calling us out of our, you know, fallenness and desperation and asking you to do what you are not able. Again, the servant of the Lord, Sister White says, in every bidding God makes for us, he's enabling. And the enabling power is these masses. The past masses, you know, the things that God has done in your life, this is the cloud of witnesses. These are the things that are motivating and pushing you. That's why you hear Paul exclaim and say, what shall we do with such manner of love? That is John saying that. Because you, Paul, I guess, says it in 2 Corinthians 5, where he says, his love, his love constraining us. You know, this is the only illustration of this I see for a young person is Joseph in the house of Potiphar presented with a grand opportunity with a woman that he could have just slept with and gone into great advantage. Can you imagine such a sugar mommy? Yeah, I'm speaking to somebody today, uh, you know, who is able to pay for you and give you every kind of coin. But Joseph asks himself, he didn't ask the woman, the woman didn't understand. He asks himself, how can I do such a thing to my God? You know, the burden of Joseph was the past mercies of God. The things that God had dealt to Joseph are what burdened him to say, how can I do this? So in Romans 12 again, here Paul is asking that we need to live our lives in the light of the things God has done to us, the mercies, the grace of God. That is what covers in Romans 12, and it tells us of how he also But when we get to Romans 13 now, the tune is changed. Now we are not being called to live our present life in the light of the past masses, but we are being called to live our present life in the future, in the light of the future return of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now that is the paradigm, children of God. Because there are three commands in Romans 13, verse 11. The first command is what we have picked as a, a that is the first command. If I want you to look, want to look at the big picture, then we get into the details of it. The first command is verse 11. It says that the hour has come for you to wake up. All right? That is the first command. The second command is in verse 12. The night is fast gone and the day is at hand. So then he says, cast off the second command, cast off. And you know, in every beating, remember that? That's in the line. In every command God gives his children, he's enabling. Therefore, they are also enabling in the text. So the first one is wake up. We want to see what are they enabling? What are they enabling for you to wake up? And then he says, cast off your works of darkness. And then the third command is put on the armor of light and let us walk properly in the day, not as, and then finally says, put on the Lord Jesus. That is essentially to explain what he means by put on the light. So now we are moving on and see some of the thing. So this is essentially the context that we have motivated by the masses of God. We present our bodies as living sacrifice. We don't allow ourselves to be conformed to the world. We allow ourselves to be transformed by, the, by mind renewal through his word, proving the will of God in our life and serving the Lord in our body. 
behaving like Christians and overcoming evil with good. That is a background. Then Paul will begin to speak to us in Romans 13, first speaking about the, the government. So moving into Romans 13, the first command of wake up is essentially like what Jesus says in Matthew 24. In the context of the final days, he tells people, therefore, for you know not what hour. Again, the word hour there, ora is the word, you are Lord that cometh. Be also ready in such an hour as you think not the Son of Man cometh. So the, 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 the call to wake up is also the call to be watchful. Be watchful. Be alert. That is the call that Jesus, remember this context of Matthew 13 is parallel to what you are reading now because here Jesus is saying, now that you don't know the hour, yet it's drawing nigh. Wake up. Be ready. That's what he says. And then we find in that same context, Paul will say, in the light of the coming day of the Lord, so then let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us awake. Now remember the word, our greetings as we began our meeting, and be sober, and be sober. Not to be caught up in some of the words that we're going to find in drunkenness. Be awake, be awake. The Bible is filled with many of these calls where God is calling us to live in the light of eternity so that we set our priorities. I want to read some of them, many of the verses, but I just pick up a few which are so relevant to me. Philippians 4, listen to what Paul says again. Philippians 4, verse 4, and I read through 7. It's interesting to hear what the Bible says. It says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything. Now, in the light of the Lord being at hand, do not be anxious, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Living in the light of eternity, Paul is saying, let us not live in anxiety, but let us be found to be prayerful. Let us allow the peace of the Lord to keep our mind being filled with thanksgiving for all the things that God is doing. There's another text that I love, Titus 2 and verse 11 to 13. Titus 2, verse 11 to 13. Again, looking at life in the light of eternity. How does it motivate our living? Titus 2, verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared all men renounce and godliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled life, upright and godly life in the present age. Why? Waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of the great God and Savior Jesus Christ. So in, 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 in waiting for the Lord's coming, in, in, in seeing our salvation drawing near, Paul is saying to Titus, then we need to renounce ungodliness. We need to renounce worldly passion. We need to live a life of self-control. We need to live uprightly and we need to live a godly life. Hebrews 10 again. Let's see again, living in the light of the coming of the Lord. See what Hebrews 10 says again. Hebrews 10 and verse 24. Hebrews 10, verse 24 says, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting meeting together as the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day of the Lord drawing nigh. Can you see again? As the day of the Lord is drawing nigh, please let's not give up our assemblies. Let's not stop coming together even though COVID is demanding that we only can go virtual. Let's not stop. In the light of the coming of the Lord, let's stir up each other towards this heavenly hope. Again, living in the light of eternity is granting us changes in our priority. James 5, again, there is another, um, another uh, admonition that God gives us there regarding life in the light of eternity. Um, uh, James 5 and verse 7. James 5 and verse 7, see what the Bible says, be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious food of the earth, 
being patient about it until it received the early and the late rains. So you also be patient, establish your heart for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Can you see that? That again, in the light of the coming of the Lord, God is admonishing us to have a life of patience, a life of waiting upon the Lord, not allowing ourselves to be consumed with anxiety because we're living in the light. Let me look at the last point here. These are beautiful texts. I would have left them, but they really bless my soul. First uh, Peter 4, verse 7 to 11. The end of all things is, her, is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another. Honestly, love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another. A good steward of God's, uh, um, God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. In order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him glory belong glory and dominion forever and ever. In the light of eternity. The end of all things at hand. So guys be sober. Be found in the Lord's service. You can see how these men of God in different contexts are using eternity, are using the hope to motivate them to certain actions. This is what the area that we're looking at. You can also read 2 Peter 3. Uh, it's interesting to read the word. I don't know whether you're somebody's reading with me, but uh, it's interesting to listen to what the word says even before we expound it. Since all these things are thus, to be dissolved. He's speaking of the day of the Lord coming as a thief and the heaven will pass away like a row and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved and the earth and the wax that are done in it will be exposed. Then he says, since all these things are thus, be, will thus be dissolved. What sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness? Now, children of God, I hope that you can see the pattern of which you want to consider today. That when people live in the light of eternity, their priorities change. It could be that probably some of us, our priorities have not changed, especially to make them uh, purposeful or uh, genuine because we have not allowed ourselves to position ourselves against the hope that we have in Jesus Christ, the salvation that is drawing out. And that's what we're talking about in this place, in this particular text. I'll go over it again. And that knowing the time, that now it's near. You can see again the one. It's because knowing the time, it's because the time is high, that now Paul gives the command, wake out of your sleep. Again, for our salvation is near than when we believe. That's the motivation of, of you waking up. That is the motivation that the Bible wants us to receive. You know, the first thing he says, knowing the time. The Bible tells us of some people in the Bible, the sons of Issachar. They were renowned of being discerners of time. Now, the Bible is, it is those who discern the times that command the times, as somebody rightly says. The, the children of Issachar were discerners of time. Romans 13 Verse 11 say, knowing the time, knowing the time. We need not just knowing. The one here knowing is just not intellectual accent or assent, but knowing the time is being wise and discerning. Meaning you can look into the, the, the weather as Jesus was rebuking the Pharisees and be able to tell it's going to rain. Children of God, as we see the unfolding events before us, as we see a small virus like coronavirus, you know, bringing the whole world to stand still. You don't want to sit back and still think business is going to be as normal. You want to become a discerner of time. This is one of the motivation. You know, you are all in school and you know what it means when it is time. When I was in high school, I remember as a form one, one of the things that I never enjoyed so much until I got into form two was when it was, we, 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 we used to be walking up, you could hear the door prefect hitting the one of the beds at the door and saying, Form one, wake up. Then you could know it's time to go and sweep the highways in school, to go and 
you know, clean up the school. And that is an experience I've never forgotten. But the thing that I draw from there, it then when you could hear the sound of the dawn prefect, we knew it was time to wake up. God is also saying that when you look around the unfolding events, it's high time you discern. You know the time, Romans 13, 11, know, discern. This word discerning, uh, Spurgeon, the prince of the pulpit, has said discernment is not knowing the difference between right and good. It's knowing the difference between right and almost right. That is what Spurgeon says. It's knowing between right and almost right. That means there should be some keen and diligence in trying to understand, not just knowing what's right, not just knowing black and white, but knowing what could be the gray areas. So that is where God is calling us in the initial part of this text, know the time. Jesus would rebuke the Pharisees of his time and say, and in the morning it will be fall. You could tell them that you people know how to study the weather, whether today the sky is red and threatening. Hypocrites, you know how to discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the sign of times. Jesus rebuked the Pharisees of that time in the manner in which they lived a hypocritical life. They didn't discern the times to have them as a motivation to set their priorities right. Now, I want to draw your attention because I'm speaking to students, uh, many of them, and I know you are keen, you have a keen mind. Now, let me give you a free course here on original language. Now, in, in, in the original language, you have two words in Greek that are related to time. There is a time we call the chronos time. This is time thought of successfully, success, successive, successively, or sequentially. That's where we get the word chronology. That's where the word chronology is from the Greek word chronos. This time, it may be measured by objective standard. You know, we measure it in calendars, in moons. That is what it's used. And we have the word kairos. Now, kairos has to do with the right time. It has to do the right measure, not simply time, but timeliness, you know, timeliness may be measured, but not always in terms of sheer quantity. Essentially, the essence, the nuance of the word kairos is the window of opportunity. Now, the good news we have here of this word, the ancient word, the, this ancient Greek word kairos, which means the right and opportune moment, the supreme moment. Kairos is the time when God acts. Now, if you want, if you wish to take, a, take notice, this is the word Paul is using in Romans 13, 11. Paul says, besides this, you know the time. He doesn't use the word chronos. He uses the word kairos. It is time. It is the time when God wants to act. That's what he says here. He's not saying that it's time, it's, 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 it's today's 22nd of August. No, no, no. He's not talking about sequential time. He's talking about the chronos. In another manner, you could say he's talking about the season. Just like the farmer says it's time to plant. That is the word that he's saying now, that this is the opportune time. It's the spring moment. And essentially, when you're reading it in a biblical text, it's talking about the time when God is ready to act. So the word is well chosen that the time you need to know is not just the days of the calendar. The time God wants you to know is the opportune time when he's about to act and do his things. So the call is for you to live by Kairos, not Kronos. That's my message. You are called to live by Kairos, not Kronos. Don't live by calendar days. Live by the season, the opportune time that God sets out, and especially for people who believe, God makes it evident to you and me. Live by Kairos and not by Kronos. Kronos has to do with the calendar days, quantity, but Kairos has to do with the quality. That's the springtime when God has to act in the world. So we need to ask ourselves, if you're going to discern the, the times we live in, we need to ask ourselves, what in the world is going on? I don't want to get into the details of that. I know that that is for another day. But what we sure, as Peter tells, Paul tells uh, 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 Timothy, but mark this. This is the chronos time. This is the kairos time. Mark this. 
that there will be terrible times in the last days. Now, there are two words in Romans 13 that suggest to us that what time is Paul speaking about is the time of the last days. Two words. If you're reading, see, he uses the word. Beside this, you know the time. And then he says that the hour. He uses two words for temporalness many times. He uses one word, time, and then the second word, hour. All these are to tell us that these are not just ordinary time. This is not just an ordinary hour. These are terrible times. These are the last days. And it is what is it that will mark the last days? People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, and holy. And this is the time. This is what marks the opportune time of God to act. And that is a place where now the call is sounded, wake up because of the time. Now, I want to go over some metaphors that Paul uses together with the word sleep. You know, metaphors of wickedness and righteousness. Paul refers to the unbelievers as sleeping and walking in darkness. So when he says, wake up from your sleep, Paul is using a metaphor of sleep to refer to unbelievers. And he uses the metaphor of darkness or night to refer to people who are wicked. Believers are supposed to be awake and walking in the light of the day. So sleep and darkness are parallel. Sleep and night are parallel. The Bible often describes this sinful world as those who live in it as in darkness or night. The Bible tells us certain and its evil forces are described as the wild forces of darkness, the forces of darkness, Ephesians 6 verse 12. Unbelievers in Ephesians 4 verse 18 are, talk, uh, are said to be darkened in their understanding. And in, in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, the Bible says that the, the God of the world has blinded them. And that says they are in darkness. We see that again, sleep and darkness, Jesus himself said that the man loved darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. Darkness and the deeds of evil men. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. And he says, if we follow him, we walk not in darkness regarding the acts and the works that we do, but we walk in the light of life. So when you're looking at these children of God, sleep and darkness, in contrast to believers with unbelievers, Paul asks a rhetoric question. What fellowship has light and darkness? This is a text that is common, especially for us young people, when we are contemplating marriage. Paul asks, what light, what is the fellowship between light and darkness? Or what has a believer and a non-believer? So you can see the parallels, you can see the relationship. And the same man as Peter will say, Peter draws the contrast and say that God has delivered us out of darkness into his marvelous light. So you are listening to the text that you're considering. When the Bible says, wake up out of your sleep, what is he saying? He's not talking about just literal sleep. He's talking about life of darkness, life of wickedness. The sleep and darkness here are tied up together to tell us that we call now in the light of the near salvation, Jesus is saying, wake up. If there are things in your life that are still given to darkness and the life of Satan, you are being called out of them because the salvation is drawing now. Now, I was looking out for the words sleep in dictionary just, just to draw some understanding. And dictionary defines sleep as a state of inactivity with a loss of consciousness and a decrease in responsiveness to the events taking place. Can you listen to something parallel to that in the physical realm that with the spiritual, that sleep is a state of inactivity? You know, and when I was reading this, I could not help. I have my daughters now who are young adults, and I can imagine that some of you could be just like them. And I know how sometimes they get caught up in activity, especially with the lockdowns. But even now, you many of you can understand, you have been on your mobile in an activity sometimes until you find that even that doesn't fall anything. It just keeps you depressed and much more anxious. So sleep here may not be only the wicked life, but also a state of inactivity. 
when we fail to utilize our strength as young people, we are asleep. God is saying, wake up and be active. It decreases of responsiveness to the events that are going on around us. Now, the interesting thing that the world thinks contrary to how the Bible describes in the world, and this is very this is very relevant to many of you who are in college. The world considers itself enlightened. Many of you, I don't know what courses you are taking, but it could be you're taking these uh, grand courses. You're, you're probably aspiring to be a lawyer or a doctor or an engineer. The world knowledge usually considers that to be enlightened. You are bright, you are progressive. Whereas the Bible considers this to be darkness. So you see, of the world, those who are learned, see those who are not learned as people who are in darkness. Primitive, that is the word they use it. But listen to what Paul says regarding the wisdom that is in the world. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21, Paul will say this, for since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through folly of what we preach to save those who believe. Meaning Paul says in the wisdom of the world, people could not know God. This is how the world uh, uh, believes. Every educated person knows that moral standards vary. This is why we hear relativism. Many of you, meaning, you know, it depends. You've heard people say, you ask them absolute questions of morality. They tell you, it depends. It depends how you see it. Now, that is the mind of how the world thinks. But remember, this is what the Bible describes as darkness. This is the sleep of the world, that moral standards vary. You know, it depends, it depends. You've had people say that, it depends. I was talking to the young group. I think I was talking, you are guys I was speaking to during the week and I was telling you about India, how girls in India now agree that they could give up, they could give their virginity for a man, a rightful man at any time if he's the one that they feel that they've fallen in love with. You know, it depends on the man. I can still strip out for any man as long as, you know, it's rightful. It depends. This is how the world thinks. This is enlightenment to the world. But the Bible describes this as darkness and being in sleep. The Bible sees that when you as a young person stands up for the righteousness of God and moral standards, that you are ignorant. Or they could even say you are arrogant to claim that your culture standards are the only right ones. I know many young men and that have uh, that have mentored and have left the country to go to England and even to USA, and uh, we kept in contact for a while. One of the things that they have always entered into is this feeling of primi uh, primitiveness. You know, when they when they are called upon to go for parties, and because they grew up in a culture where standards are held high, they could say that they are not going, and they could come telling me, Pastor, I feel so odd. Everyone looks. It's like I am not uh, uh, because they expect that as a young person, I should engage myself in departing and all the wild things that go on. So children of God, the world of darkness, the Bible tells us night in this sense, in the Romans 13, represent the present age. When, the, when Paul is saying that wake up for the night is fast spent, he's telling us the present age is in darkness. It represents man's present day. It's a symbol of a life of sin. It's a symbol of evil. It's a symbol of ungodliness. The sleep and the night is, 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 is also a time of illusion, you know, ugliness and beauty. You know, uh, uh, people say that in darkness, you cannot tell a beautiful and ugly woman. They all are the same. No, that's not against my sisters and my daughters listening. But just to make a point, the darkness makes things to be blah, you can tell. So we are living in time when it's darkness, we can't distinguish what is ugly and beauty. Gold and rocks are indistinguishable. You know, I don't know some of you, I came up in the village. Now, <laughs> some of the stories are weird, but they are true, you know, they are true. And I tell them with great pain, but uh, they are true, you know, these are, at times you, right, we lived in the village where you know there's no light, you walk in darkness. Sometimes you're grumbling around to find probably, um, <laughs> you're looking maybe for something in the corner somewhere in the house because you don't have the light or you don't have the flashlight. And uh, you feel like you have touched something cold. And, uh, lo and behold, it was a snake 
And this is how some of us have grown. God delivers you in that moment. Darkness cannot help you tell whether a snake is in the corner or it's maybe a shoes that you're looking for. All are the same. The life today we live in is you can't distinguish. And some of us, that's why we're getting into this mentality and mindset of it depends. Because that's what people want, want you to believe, that it depends. But God is calling us. He's saying, no, darkness is in the world. Wake up. And what is the darkness here in practical terms? Number one, darkness concerns God. God. The people today don't believe in God anymore. You talk about God, you look like you're funny. You're weird. People don't, darkness, people are blinded because of God. You talk about God, you're weird. Darkness concerning man. Men are basically good. That's what the world tells us, that people are good. People are good. You know, people have only thought to be um, uh, bad when, uh, when they don't do what other people do. That's when you say you are mean, you are arrogant. That's when you are bad. But essentially, everybody's good. We are all moving, progressing to the best of ourselves. The world is civil, in civilization is progressing towards goodness. This is the darkness in the world. There is darkness concerning purpose of living. Young people are find themselves so disillusioned because darkness, people don't know what am I intended, but what is my, my reason? The big question is God, why am I here? Nobody can be able to discern that because they're not living in the light of eternity. There is also darkness concerning death, except for recent times that now Corona is making death to be real to many people. People who live in the, in the developed world of occult, where the devil now is enabling people to in, interact with demons which impersonate uh, their relatives who have gone before. That death is not a reality. Death is nothing. In fact, you talk about dying peacefully in, in believing in the Lord Jesus, nobody believes you. So there's darkness. But now we know Jesus has told us the wages of sin is death. We know that. We live in the light of that revelation. We know that there is eternity. We know Jesus is coming and he will take us to live with him forever. So these are realities, children of God. Works of darkness, when you move forward, Paul will say in Romans 12, that therefore those who live in darkness are living in sexual immorality, sexual pro, uh, promiscuity and sensuality. You know, sexual intercourse outside marriage is essential to what they say. Speaking to you, my children, speaking new children of God, is this not a reality? Yeah. Is it not a reality? This is the wax of darkness. This is the wax of the night. These are the wax upon which we're being called to wake up. You know, how many of you can now be able to stand up and be able to stand and say to the world, no sex before marriage? You find many are struggling, many are struggling because they are still asleep. The Bible says, wake up for your salvation is drawn. Second and restrained lust that Paul describes. It is also the deeds of the flesh of unbelievers. So God has given marriage to us. Paul highlights that among the first ones. And he says that this is not proper. I think I spoke about it last in our course that sex is not the problem. Lust is the problem. So to engage in sexual activities outside marriage is to participate in the deeds of darkness, is to be asleep and need to wake up, as the Bible tells us in this sense. The third thing that works of, of darkness is strife and jealousy. If you're looking at Romans 12, verse 13. So all these things are vices, children of God. We cannot have the time to be able to exhaust and look at the nitty-gritty of them. But that is the first commandment. Wake up. God is saying, wake up. It's time to wake up from your sleep. It's a spiritual command. It's time to, it's not time to sleep in works of darkness. It's time to wake up. It's not time to be drunken in acts of the darkness or to slumber. It's time to wake up. It's a longer time for deeds of darkness. It's time to wake up. Now, what does it say about spirituality? It is a call to look at your priorities. It's a call to see what you are doing with your life now. This is not the time to sleep and slumber or loaf it. This is a time to be alert, a time to wake up, a time to set your priorities right. There are some pressing demands, things at hand, but it's a time to live in the light of the eminent. Why does Paul want you to wake up? 
verse 11 says, because your salvation is drawing nigh. And what does that mean? We all understand what salvation has to do. I've already said it's the past, the present, and the future. The past involves the death of Jesus on the cross for us. For the present salvation is going on now. God desires that we all may be forgiven. As good Adventists, we know what Jesus is doing. He's just about to stand up and say it is finished in the courts of heaven when all the records of men shall have been finished. And then Jesus stands up to come as the King of Kings. At the moment, he's praying for each one of you. He wants all of us to be saved. He wants us to be forgiven. He wants us to live holy before the Lord. But what he's saying, why you need to work is because of your future salvation. In Romans 8, Paul says, even creation itself is groaning. They want to experience the experience of the children of God. This is what we call glorification, in which Paul is referring, your salvation is coming nigh. Jesus is about to come, children of God. And that is what it is. So in the light of your glorification, wake up. That's the reason why you're being woken up. Your glorification, your change is coming. The change you can believe in that Jesus will bring is coming nigh, for Jesus is about to come. So the urgency of the moment that is compelling us to wake up is the time of Christ coming. The era of darkness is drawing nigh to an end. Listen to what the Bible says, that for the honest expectation of the creatures waits for the manifestation of the sons of God. Children of God, the second command that you're being told is to cast off. Now, I don't want to get into all the details that Paul gives us here, but casting off those wax of darkness that we have been able to tell. Then the third command is put on. Now, there is always a problem. Many of us truly respond to the call to cast off. Many of us could respond to the call to wake up, but God wants you to move a step further. Verse 12 says, put on the armor of light. Verse 13, meaning, you know, remember Jesus said the parable that uh, 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 a man who demons that live his life, but since he doesn't engage into the things of God, the demons that leave come back, seven of them and fill it. This is what happens. We can wake up, we can cast off the acts of darkness, but if we don't respond to the second command, put on the armor of God, then we still may find ourselves in problem. Behave properly. Put on the day's glow. Act as one who is in the light. Light represents purity, holiness, and righteousness. This is what we are being asked to do. Again, Peter will tell you what kind of person should we be in goodness, holiness, and also righteousness. We are children of light, as the Bible says, and we need to walk in that sense. So put on has to do with the life that you lead. Now, you want to follow Paul in this sense because he... and think that when God is commanding you to put on, it's something that you have to accomplish by yourself. But it gives us what accomplishes that. Verse 14, put on the Lord Christ, Jesus Christ. And how do you put on the Lord Jesus Christ? How do you put on the Lord Jesus Christ? Verse 14 gives us, make no provision for flesh or to gratify its desire. So when you don't give provision for flesh, you're putting on the Lord Jesus Christ. That is what the Bible is telling us. This is what Jesus has given you, a positional acceptance to God. You are a child of God because of Jesus Christ. And not only that, you also still to let him clothe you practically in sanctification so that you can become like Jesus. Just like the song says, Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look forth in his wonderful face. And the things of the world will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. That means the change in us depends on how much we behold him. And we behold him in his word as we keep close to his word. We become like him. We pursue his goals and we press on to the man that we have in Jesus Christ. So the putting on 
Christ has to do with making no provision for flesh. Now, I know at times we wonder, how do we overcome our besetting sins of flesh? I want to tell you, child of God, we cannot of ourselves. And we should not even struggle with them. What God wants you to do is to concentrate on putting on Christ and the works of flesh. That's why the Bible says, make no provision for them. The way not to make provision for the things of the flesh is to put on Christ, to put on the arm of flesh. The things of flesh are inherently you, you. But the manner in which we overcome them is to fill our life, to make provision for the things of God. And as you make provision for the things of God, the things of flesh begin to die a natural death. That's why the book of Galatians say this. Galatians. Listen to what the book of Galatians says in that regard. Same response. I'm bringing this to an end, child of God. In, in, in response to a life of, of, of Christ, a life of awakeness, he says this um, in, in Galatians. He says, uh, verse 18, I guess. Let me read verse 16. Galatians 5, verse 16. But I say, I say, walk by the Spirit. Listen to this. And you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the, of the spirit. And the desires of the spirit against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other. Keep on. Keep you doing the things which you want. So the thing is, we are not called to struggle against the flesh. We are called to walk in the spirit. And the walk of the spirit is like now we're here in fellowship. Keep the fellowship in the light of eternity. The things of the, the, the spirit are keep on praying that the peace of God may keep your mind in the light of eternity. In that manner, you are putting on Christ and the don't act on the flesh, no matter what it is, whether it's sexual passion or materialism, whatever it is, make no provision to it. This is not the time to indulge yourself in things upon our own flesh. This is a serious need. This is the time when the dawn is coming. And the dawn means judgment for us and for the ungodly. It is time to put on Christ. So child of God, as I bring this to an end, and wake up is essentially to remind you that you should not keep sleeping. And the sleep here is an analogy or a metaphor that reminds you of the wax of darkness, of inactivity, or of not responding to the events around you. And you cannot just wake up. God wants you to put on the armor of light, living in the acts of the light. The book of Ephesians 5 will give you the details of what is expected to live a life of light. And that life of light is described as putting on Christ and also is further expounded by not giving provision to the life of the flesh. You and me are called to a great wake up. May the Lord bless you and may he continue to encourage you, encourage you to change your priorities because you have begun to live in the light of eternity. God bless you. Not sure whether I need to pray as I bring this to an end. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Pastor. Uh, for that, we welcome uh, Darius to give us a set of music and then we can pray. I think because of time, uh, Pastor, you can, can pray and then, uh, and then we finish it. All right. I can pray, right? Yes. Okay, let's pray. To the Lord God of heaven, who has called us out of darkness into this marvelous light again. We celebrate, Lord, as we give you praise. For you have been opened our eyes that we may see and not be blinded. You have awakened us up, Lord, by your spirit in Christ Jesus, that we may not live again in the light of darkness, but in the light of our Lord Jesus Christ. I pray for your children, Lord, that today I've come on this forum. Listen to your word. Father, please, that your spirit will fill them with your love 
and your peace will be keep their minds and heart that they will desire to live in the light of eternity and change their priorities. We give honor and glory to you. Bless us through this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you very much, Pastor uh, Sobel. May God bless you, and indeed, may God wake us up. May we, uh, may we, may we depend upon Him. I know I was telling a friend that I, I really want to know what God needs me to do, but He reminded me, yeah, yes, God can tell us what we ought to do, but also we depend upon Him to help us make, do what we ought to do. So may God wake us up. Uh, thank you very much. God bless you abundantly. It has been a blessing to all of us. I will now welcome uh, Darius to usher us into the lunchtime. Uh, he'll play a song and then uh, uh, the members who will be maybe willing and um, looking to sing will be having a lunchtime choir here. Uh, so as you hit, hit, come back as we enjoy the lunchtime choir together. Various. Uh, are you there? Or he has yes, uh, I am. left? Fine, thank you. I am here. Okay, we are going to do the hymn face to face which is uh, number 206 in our hymnal. Christ, my Savior. you don't like Go.
Amen. 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 My Savior. Amen. <laughs> uh, now we'll go into the call it the line time session. Um, I think uh, Darius, if you're not uh, you're not uh, tired or, or uh, we can give you time to, to, to take lunch. Uh, if you don't mind, you can give us one item and then um, anyone you want to see, you can just raise your hand and then you can give you a chance to give us that uh, item. If you're not tired, you can. Are you able to do one or you do it later? There is. Okay, I'll do one song. Thank you. I'll do it maybe at morn when the day is awake. It may be a call. Thank you. 